The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Uh, I want to start off with a little, I guess, um, some football smorgasbord here. Let's a medley, if you will. Smorgasbord and a medley are two totally different things. I meant a medley. football, Football season. It is football, like season. football season outside football stew. What I'm right. I guess. Yeah. Let's do a little Buffalo football medley because the university at Buffalo opens its mid American conference schedule Saturday at noon uh, at home against Western Michigan. Uh, they'll obviously be there in UB stadium, uh, which is a topic we didn't address uh, since I wrote the story on the Buffalo Bills wanting the University at Buffalo to join them in their new stadium venture, wherever it may be. And I spoke with Mark Allnut, the athletics director at UB about this, and Ron Rakuya, who's the executive vice president of Pagula Sports and Entertainment, uh, their thoughts. And um, while flattered to be offered this opportunity, Mark Allnut uh, told me for the article that ran in The Athletic last week, that uh, UB obviously wants to stay on campus and for, for all those reasons. And Jonah, I know that you, uh, with all of your coverage at UB and the connections that you have there, you have some uh, good background to fill in some of the, uh, some of the spaces and to give a little bit more of UB's thinking regarding uh, this stadium venture. Uh, but just to set it up, uh, the Buffalo Bills looked at three potential sites uh, back in uh, 2019, their outside uh, consulting firms uh, brought in to examine the best possible place for uh, the next home of the Buffalo Bills, uh, being Orchard Park across the street uh, on Abbott Road, um, downtown by Perry Projects, and a University at Buffalo site, which would be, uh, I could give you the coordinates, it's uh, Maple Road, uh, Maple Road to the south, Audubon Parkway to the north, Sweet Home Road to the west, Flint Road to the east. However, I could probably more easily say, if you know where Zeddy's is and you're facing the entrance to Zeddy's, just turn around and look across the street. Uh, that's where that would be. Um, Governor Cuomo, and I can't really get an answer why, dismissed UB as a possible site. Now, of course, he's no longer in office, but I still can't get any reason. Nobody knows. Mark Allnut didn't know the reason. Uh, Ron Rakuya doesn't know the reason. Uh, Governor Cuomo is not doing interviews these days, so I couldn't ask him. Um, anyways, that's my setup regarding uh, similar to what the Raiders have done with UNLV and making the local Division I college your partner in this venture. And it makes sense because the state would essentially be giving itself um, uh, part of this experience of having a new stadium to have its state university playing in a building that is paid for uh, by a lot of public dollars. Yeah. I, well, so I, I appreciated your story and I found it interesting and especially that somebody's doing some reporting and asking questions and bringing this into the public discussion because everything so far has been about talking about the plans that seem to be almost set in stone, if you will, to build the stadium in Orchard Park. And then there's a lot of dialogue and debate about whether the stadium should be downtown. And it seemed to have been forgotten that that UB site was in the initial study and considered maybe a viable option. I don't know. If all of those, stadium... oh, I should add this just for comprehensive purposes. 
the, all, the study that the Bills commissioned also looked at renovating the current stadium. So that's in there too. Um, but it should be noted that the state hasn't done its due diligence in its study and that they're in the process of doing that. And Kathy Hochul has said that that will be coming out in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, but the state is going to have a large say as to where the stadium goes, meaning that downtown and the University of Buffalo site and technically refurbishing the current uh, Highmark Stadium are still all on the table. We just only know that the Buffalo Bills prefer and their research shows across Abbott Road is what they want. Right. Well, let's take downtown out of it for now, just for this discussion, because as you've reported, others have reported, that's a much more expensive proposition, the scope of the project, with just the different moving parts and entities involved would be a much bigger deal. And there's more roadblocks maybe to, for that happening. Um, in terms of what I've seen in your stories and elsewhere, the Orchard Park Stadium and a potential Amherst Stadium are about equal cost wise. So the money would be about the same. Uh, the big advantage for the Amherst site, well, one of the big advantages is that it's a better use of public taxpayer dollars, state dollars. It would go towards uh, benefiting the university and the university athletics program, which is, you know, the SUNY system. I do think that would have to be the driving force behind whether it happened. It would have to be the governor or the SUNY chancellor or state legislators deciding that this is what we want. This is how we are going to invest our dollars. And this would be a better um, use of all this public taxpayer money to put it into multiple uses. You get more dates at the stadium, more ways it could be used. And even, and this is a hypothetical, but what if say 20, 25 years from now, or sometime within the next, that time period, the bills were to move, the franchise were to leave it. There would be a giant stadium in Orchard Park that would really get no use. Now, if that stadium was at the university of Buffalo, that program's not going anywhere. It's probably not dropping division one, even though, it did that once in its history, but so there could be a use that, that could be a factor in having a stadium that could be used if the bills were to leave somewhere down the line. I know the lease, there would probably be a lease that would keep that from happening anytime soon, but it could happen as the decades go by. The other part of, well, the big missing piece from the reporting in your story and what we haven't seen yet is why. Excuse me. Decide? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, you mentioned it. You, we don't How know why. dare you. We don't oh, know why. I, oh, I see. I thought you were criticizing my reportage. I wasn't criticizing your reporting, but I was hoping that maybe a source would lead you to figure yes. that out. Maybe Me too. there is. Me too. Maybe there is a big roadblock, or maybe there is a compelling reason why the state decided that's not where we want the stadium. Um, and maybe it has nothing to do with UB. Maybe it's the location in Amherst or the land or the infrastructure. Now the highway system is probably better at UB than, than I think it is out in Orchard Park. So I don't know if that access roads and things like that would be a problem. There's a lot there of would, space. There's no direct exit uh, for Maple right there off of 290, but very close by. Obviously you have the Sheridan exit, you have the Niagara Falls exit, uh, and then the 990 wraps around that area too. Right. And you have Millersport Highway, which is a, you know two lanes each direction that could be shut down or reversed on game day to make it all go, all flow the same direction. Right. And there's a lot of space between the, uh, the shooting range land that used to be a, a gun range right there on Maple Road and Audubon Golf Course, which was in the news this week, it, it being upgraded and will continue to be a public golf course. But if there was a big stadium project there, I think some of that land would be converted to parking lots or access roads or infrastructure in some way. But there's a big footprint there where a large football stadium could go and it would make sense and it would serve the needs of Bills fans and the Bills, as well as University of Buffalo and University of Buffalo football and the public in general. And there's One not a lot I on that property either. There are some administrative buildings. You wouldn't have to displace much of uh, the campus lifestyle, uh, from, for lack of a better term, not classrooms. Uh, there are some... Uh, facilities, utility type buildings. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, on-campus housing, uh, but it's, it, would, it doesn't seem significant at all. If you were to take a look at a Google map of that area I just told you about, it's, yeah. it seems it's on, like a pretty good spot. It's on the edge of campus where a lot of that is green space. I do think there's a water treatment facility or something. There is. Do. Yeah. So there'll be something like that would need to be moved, but all those things could be worked out. Um, but it's a, a if you take that 
edge of the campus and the shooting range and some of the different land there, town owned land with the Pepsi center and softball field. There's a lot of underdeveloped unused land right in the middle of the biggest, largest, wealthiest suburb, one of the wealthiest suburbs in Western New York. It seems like one way or the other, that area of Western New York needs to be developed and a stadium could be a good use of it. We can go back and forth about whether stadiums are proper economic development for towns. But I think in that context, I like the UB option better than the downtown option for various reasons, for the area, for the region, for the Bills, for UB, for the Bills and the UB fans. One thing I'm not sure about with a potential stadium on the UB campus is, you know, is there another NFL stadium that's on a UB, on a college campus or right next to a college campus? And is that, is that the roadblock? Is that something that the NFL and the Bills want? Do you want to mix these 60,000 tailgaters on Sunday with the student population at a university where the enrollment's almost 40,000? If there's a Monday or a Thursday night game, is that a problem? I mean, when ECC, when there's primetime games in Orchard Park, ECC tends to cancel classes and doesn't have the students come out and, uh, you know, integrate with that traffic. Um, is that something that UB can handle uh, when the issues arise? Or is that a problem for the Bills and the NFL? Is there any problem with UB having home games on a Saturday and then turning around and having home games on a Sunday? Is there issues just with, do you want students coming over and being so close to all that crazy tailgating and things like that? You know, what does that do to uh, the land and the campus community? I don't know if maybe or just the educational why. atmosphere, you know, the idea of we're an academic institution and you have people um, getting inebriated to the point of, uh, you know, being needed to be taken to the hospital. I mean, but hey, colleges have fraternity row also. Um, that's a much more right. Yeah, scale. I mean, for college students and and people that have been to tailgates at big major SEC Division One schools, they'll probably say, "Oh, that's great." But I don't know if it really is what college administration and state officials and campus safety and police would really want to mix those two large masses. That's a great point, together. and that could be the answer right there, Jonah. It, it, it makes sense. Uh, I can get there. I can understand that line of thinking at least. I can't, I can't fathom right at the moment, a uh, fathom's not the right word. I can't think of uh, a current NFL stadium that is on an, that is on a college campus. Uh, maybe one will come to me. I, I, I don't have the, I just went through the bill schedule. That's the most amount of teams. There are in, colleges in and NFL teams that share stadiums like Heinz field and Pittsburgh, but I, I can't, think there of are nine, NFL there are nine of them. Um, yeah. And you also have uh, temple plays uh, at uh, Lincoln financial field in Philadelphia. Uh, the Miami hurricanes play at the dolphin stadium. Um, University of South Florida plays uh, at uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers Stadium. There's a handful of those, but yeah, they are not on campus. Uh, I mentioned already the UNLV at the Raiders. Um, yeah, I can't. I, can't I don't think, think there is. Of... I mean, you would know better. You travel more and know more of these details, but I don't think that there is. I don't know if that's intentional. Or it used to be the Arizona Cardinals played at Sun Devil Stadium on the Arizona state campus, but that's a very sprawl. That's a massively large campus and it's in this, you know, it's in Tempe, Arizona, and there is infrastructure galore out there. Uh, that's a little different. Um, no, I can't think of any others. Yeah. So maybe that is why the state, maybe it wasn't Andrew Cuomo himself. Maybe it was SUNY or state officials that said that's a non-starter. We don't want that there. Or people saw this issue on the horizon and thought, you know, we shouldn't go too far down that road. The other side of the other, well, most of what your story was about, well, I think that it, what originated from is the bills and the people negotiating for this new stadium kind of want to bring UB into the process of maybe playing games in Orchard Park or downtown or wherever the stadium is off campus. And I would agree with, uh, you know, what Mark Allnott said and what UB saying that that's not really uh, a tenable situation or not something that UB really wants to do. And I, I, cause I saw some people jump into some conclusions based on your reporting about things that maybe UB is planning or will be aggressive in pursuing home games against Syracuse or Penn state to play in those stadiums. One, I don't see that happening. I think that's going to be very, very difficult 
for UB to get those games. Maybe if PSC got involved in brokering that kind of situation for the first year of the stadium, especially with those Penn State connections, maybe that happens once as a special attraction. But I think the way college football non-conference games get scheduled, uh, just because they have a 60,000 seat stadium isn't going to be enough to entice Syracuse or UB. It's going to take a lot of dollars and a lot of negotiation. And even at that point, I don't know if you'd be able to convince Penn State or Syracuse to leave campus and play those games. Uh, you might have an, a better chance if you're a PSC in brokering a game where Penn State plays against Syracuse or something like that. Those neutral site games between two Power 5 schools happen a lot more often than a Power 5 school coming to a Mid-American Conference team on the road. Along the same lines, uh, a new stadium could make a push to host a bowl game. That might be something that could get use out of the new stadium. They could do it at the current stadium just as well. And may, it, whether it's on campus or off campus, I do think maybe that's something that could happen if you were looking for new ways to use a new stadium. Nick, even think of when UB played Ohio State, uh, turning that into a home and home. Now, Ohio State would never make it a home and home at the current UB stadium, but in a 62,000 seat NFL stadium in which they know that they would travel and they could fill the place with their own fans more than Western New York fans. That, I mean, those are the types of things that would be possible. But uh, I don't think they would. I think that I don't think they would. I don't think you'd be able to make that deal. You'd have to guarantee Ohio State a lot of money to give up because Ohio State can play uh, seven home games. They can play that extra non-conference. Oh, but I'm saying that that would be one of their road games, perhaps. Right. But what I'm saying is Ohio State's not going to leave home for a non-conference game unless it's a competitive game against another Power 5 school that helps them like that. They just make too much money at home to go on the road and potentially lose to a team like Buffalo. Now, the other part of it I don't think Buffalo program where it is right now needs a 60,000 foot state, a 60,000 seat stadium. Maybe there's this one right, game against Syracuse or Penn state, but for most of their games, they're not drawing anywhere close to that. They had a nationally ranked team in town a couple of weeks ago and the attendance was 16,000. It was probably a smaller crowd than that. Uh, now there's a pandemic going on in coastal Carolina. Isn't Ohio state. There's a few different factors there, but when Buffalo tried to play, a game at the Bill Stadium a few years ago against Bowling Green on Thanksgiving weekend. That crowd was only about 25,000, and I don't think there were 25,000 people there either. So a 30,000-seat stadium like UB currently has seems to be right-sized to what a Mid-American Conference program needs. Now, if it was decided by the state and SUNY and, and the different powers that be involved to put the campus on UB's campus or near UB's campus, then I think that would have to be accompanied by a real push to invest in the athletic program and bring UB into a major conference. The Big Ten probably be in the best fit. And if that were to happen, then all of a sudden there would be a need for a bigger 60,000-seat stadium because then you're getting Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, all of these Big Ten programs on your campus for conference regular season games uh, week after week. And that's the kind of thing that I think would – entice local fans and bring them out. And at that point, uh, UB would need to play in an NFL stadium, I think, if they were in the Big Ten. But that's probably not happening, and it would take a lot to get from this point to that point. It wouldn't just be, hey, we put the shovel in the ground for a stadium. It would take a lot of investment and planning and and pushing for that to happen. One of the games uh, that would not uh, be held uh, if, uh, if, let's say, uh, the Bills uh, stadium does go in Orchard Park or downtown. It doesn't end up on campus, which is, seems to be the way everything's leaning. And one of those super matchups that you might want to, you know, UB maybe playing a game or two a year at, uh, at the new stadium out in Orchard Park. Uh, one of those opponents would not be Western Michigan uh, coming into uh, Amherst uh, on Saturday to open the MAC schedule. Jonah, your, your thoughts on this game as UB opens uh, conference play? Well, it's UB's first conference game. They went two and two in the non-conference season with one of the wins against uh, FCS Wagner. And then they just beat one at Old Dominion, kind of hung on after having a 28-point lead and letting that squander away in the second half and almost losing. But a missed extra point saved them at the end. Well, I shouldn't say almost losing, but almost going to overtime there. Um, so UB's two and two, but doesn't really have a real impressive win yet on its resume. Lost, to, lost at Nebraska, lost at home against Coastal Carolina. 
But that's about where a MAC team, most of the MAC teams are either two and two or worse than their non conference. In fact, West, well, Western Michigan is one of two, three, and one teams. And Western Michigan has a win against, a win at Pitt and a win over San Jose State, which they won pretty handily. So they're coming in, probably haven't performed better in non conference than Buffalo did. Uh, they haven't played since they played four years ago, and that was the highest scoring game in NCAA history, seven overtimes. Uh, Western Michigan ended up winning 78 to 68. This will be the first time these two teams played against them. Western Michigan's favored by five points last I looked. Uh, it was a couple of days ago. I don't know if that line moved. But Buffalo's good at home. They, you know, they won 10 of their last 11 home games against MAC opponents. They dominated MAC teams at home in the last couple seasons. Even though they didn't beat Coastal Carolina, they played pretty well at home. So I think the way Buffalo's playing, they have a very good chance to win this game. But it, it could be a good barometer for how good this season goes. If they win the game, I think you, you can believe that, at least at home and in most of these matchups, Buffalo is going to contend for the MAC title. If they lose the game, not only do they set up at 0-1, but I think you have a lot less confidence and belief that they're going to contend for a MAC title if they don't win this first game. The betting public likes Western Michigan because it is now seven point spread. Uh, you'd be getting seven points if you want to bet on uh, the home team. The total for those curious and su- uh, curious of such things, 59 and a half, or you can get it upwards. Uh, you can get it at 60 and a half uh, at a couple of places. Um, and at seven uh, at home, that seems like a pretty big number. I think they were only about 10 and a half against nationally ranked Coastal Carolina. So Something about the bookmakers and the betting public don't believe in this UB team quite as much as uh, maybe I would looking at them neutrally on paper. What is uh, UB administration saying regarding uh, the vaccination situation for uh, Saturday's game? So Saturday's game will be the first of this season where they have a policy in place where you have to be vaccinated. You have to have at least one of your vaccination shots and you have to show proof, be it a vaccination card or one of the digital apps that uh, verify that you've been vaccinated. Copies are being accepted. And this will be the first campus event, I believe. It's definitely the first athletic event that that's in place at UB. Um, They've had a mask rule in place for the previous home games. And now that mask rule is being relaxed a little bit and that you don't, not asking you to wear it outdoors anymore, but still indoors and, uh, concourses and suites and things like that very similar to what the bills and Kenesha's just announced a, a vaccination policy for their indoor events well for all campus events actually and indoors being that you would have to wear a mask so I think this is coming to be not just a UB or a Kenesha's policy it's coming to be a state and Erie County policy for sporting events uh, that you have to have proof of vaccination to get in at the end of the month UB will transition to having to be fully vaccinated by the time you get to the October 30th game against Bowling Green. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that maybe affects attendance, if they have any issues enforcing that rule, as maybe people did at Highmark Stadium for the first Bills game. And then will this, I'm really curious to see how this, if this will trickle down to high school events, which aren't huge, you know, you're not getting 10, 20, 30,000, but you're getting several hundred people packed in together at high school events. And when you add up all of the different football games, it does come out to be tens of thousands of people across the area. Right now, there's no policies that I'm aware of at any school uh, for any sort of showing your vaccination or anything like that to get into high school events. Um, But as we move into the winter season and indoor things like that, um, you know, hopefully there's some thought being placed into that and, and maybe colleges and professional teams doing that will cause schools and administrators and now Jonah you're following the college uh, athletics uh, a lot more closely than I do of course Uh, what is um, what's the status of some of these events Uh, there some are being canceled right I haven't seen any college events being canceled I'm talking about high schools well high school games are being canceled Lewiston Porter football has, we're now in week five, and they've had three of their five games canceled. I've seen other schools. I, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to talk off the top of my head, list every school that's had a game canceled. But other than the opening week, I think there's been a football game canceled or postponed every week since. 
And it does seem – now this is an outgrowth Is it based of, on the players? There are too many players well, on the teams testing positive? I don't know if in every case it's based entirely on the players or – I do think in every case there's probably at least a player or two that's tested positive, and that's why the game was postponed. They don't always tell us, or you got to do a lot of digging to find out which team is the reason why the game was postponed. Uh, you know, it's not always very clear that the game was canceled because Team A had cases and Team B didn't. Sometimes you have to guess. But it's also – this is just a symptom and an outgrowth of outbreaks that are going on in the schools. And because their mass congregate settings and the vaccination levels are much lower uh, with teenagers and school-aged kids and just the different reasons why uh, there's a lot more cases in schools than there maybe are in different settings and outside of schools in our area right now. And the athletes are, you know, students, they're student athletes. And so I think if there's cases in the schools, that's obviously going to have an effect on sporting events. And the point I've been trying to make in a few of these conversations we have on the podcast is I feel like in some ways we're sticking our head in the sand about that. We're kind of just saying, hey, we already had two uh, high school years that were that the athletic seasons were ruined by the pandemic. We're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to play the games as normal. And I, I don't agree with that. I think there should be more effort being put towards uh, vaccination policies or masks or testing, which is really something that has gone away, although I believe it's coming back in October. There's more rules about testing in schools. And I think there should be more testing protocols related to playing the games. And maybe that's why some of these games are being canceled because they are doing some testing. But I think a lot of that is just testing and reported cases that come out of the classrooms affecting the games. I don't think it's test specific to the athletic events that are causing these cancellations and postponements. Anything else you want to touch on, uh, Jonah, before we get to uh, Joel Staniszewski on the line from Vegas? Well, since we're on the vaccine topics, what were your thoughts about how well that went at Highmark Stadium last week? And some of, I don't know what you've seen, some of the anecdotal reports about uh, maybe people that weren't vaccinated were able to find their way. There were some leaks and loopholes, I think, in that policy on the first weekend. Well, just a couple of observations, really. I think the one that a lot of people saw because it was posted on social media is Rachel Bush, who has promoted herself as an anti-vaxxer uh, proudly, uh, was at the game, leading a lot of people to wonder, maybe she's actually vaccinated and she's just playing some kind of role. Uh, after the game, she was running around on the field, uh, the family was, and to the point where during Sean McDermott's news conference, a voice came over the PA internally within the bowels of, of the stadium to say, to tell the deputies to clear the field. And it kind of annoyed Sean McDermott while we were watching while we're at Sean McDermott's news conference, we didn't know what they were saying to clear the field uh, of uh, came to later find that it was, it was the Poyers running around on the field within full view of the press box and all the media that's sitting up there in the press box. So I don't know who, uh, decided how important it was to get the Poyers off the field. Um, and we don't really know why um, uh, Rachel Bush was in the stadium. Maybe it was legit. Like I say, maybe it's all a ruse uh, to drum up support, social media, branding, uh, to get people in a frenzy because she can, uh, manipulating people through uh, the power of public persuasion, um, and we haven't been able to ask Jordan Poyer about it either because he's been injured and not practicing. So we haven't seen him this week. He has that uh, ankle injury that Sean McDermott put him as at day to day. Uh, and he did not practice Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so that, that was just interesting to me. And a lot of fans saw it and it was a, a popular discussion. On yeah, I mean, media. I watched it. I was upstairs in the press box transcribing when that happened. I saw the whole thing unfold and I thought it was, Interesting. And I don't want to make the assumption as to who was or wasn't vaccinated. And because knowing that information would change maybe how you react to that situation. But it was startling to see somebody who's been very vocal and not just being against the vaccine, but against um, the policies to have to insist on vaccinations being a uh, prerequisite for entry into the stadium. So whether Rachel Bush herself and the different family members that were involved with that got vaccinated. She's still somebody that has been making public statements that they shouldn't be requiring vaccinations to go to the stadium. So 
I don't know if there was something a little bit performative about being there, being on the field and being in the public eye and being seen at the game when you aren't in support of the vaccination policy, or if it was really just an innocent, uh, the family meeting with Jordan Poyer by the field and everybody was vaccinated and there's really nothing wrong with that. was interesting how... There's a third possibility. There's a third possibility, and this is something I guess we should be able to clarify pretty easily through the NFL or Bill's public relations is that family is falls within the NFL community. Erie County has clearly made um, the N they're going to let the NFL's protocols uh, handle the players and staff and administration during the game, because unlike the NBA, from what it sounds like, some of these arenas were saying, everybody has to be vaccinated. Even if you're on the team, you're not allowed in this building. Some, some um, government agencies are saying that. Erie County has not done that. It has left it up to the team to manage that. So maybe there's a, a loophole well, so where families, you know, if you're in a family area or something, I don't, I'm-, I'm Maybe I'm there is. Concerned. And so I'm glad you brought that up because if that's the case, I think that's wrong. I think that if the vaccine policy is in place because as a public health measure, to, because there's, you know, 60, 70,000 people all gathered together and it's better for everybody's health and safety that everybody's vaccinated. That's why it's in place. It's not there as a, you know, punishment or incentive for people to get vaccinated. It's to keep unvaccinated people out of the stadium to protect everybody else that is in the stadium. So if exemptions are being made for certain fans over other fans, I also know some of the workers and security people at the stadium that, you know, that policy didn't apply to everybody that worked the game as well. And the players as well. You know, I would, I don't know if anybody that influential is listening to this, but I would commend uh, those in New York City and San Francisco that have put these rules in place and say that the NBA players and NHL players in Canada are not exempt from these vaccine policies, because I just don't think that it's fair. I understand why the Players associations have this bargaining power and can make the players exempt from these vaccination rules, but it really isn't fair to society that every coach and staff member and trainer and fan and media person that has to get into an NBA arena or an NFL stadium has to be vaccinated and show this proof. But the football players don't have to do that. And I would ask, I wish this was a bit more in the dialogue with Cole Beasley and Josh Allen and these Buffalo Bills players that we believe didn't get vaccinated or we're not sure if they are vaccinated. And, uh, you know, why, what do they say to the fans that have to show proof of vaccination to get into the game, but they don't have to follow those same rules? You know, why are they exempt and, and how do they feel about being, having that exemption and being put on a pedestal like that? And is that fair? I understand the players are why we're all at the game to watch the game, but you know, there's other football players. If these unvaccinated players don't want to play, if Kyrie Irving doesn't want to get vaccinated, Somebody else can go in the game and take those shots and take those uh, snaps. Got to be careful when you're talking about basketball, about taking those shots. Different types of shots. I, the other, I, I mean, the, the other observation. The stuff's been fascinating. Have you watched how that's kind of unfolded? Oh, yeah. A lot, yeah, more yeah absolutely. Talk. A lot more of the unvaccinated basketball players seem to be coming out and explaining why they're not getting vaccinated and, and a few more of the vaccinated basketball players saying why they are vaccinated. It's been less of, you know, this is a personal issue that I don't want to talk about. Some of the players have taken that stance, but it's a lot less. So there's a lot more dialogue back and forth about whether NBA players should or should not get vaccinated. And I think with the NFL, there was a lot of, we're going to keep this in-house and we're not going to talk about that. And then the other observation I had was the contradictory messaging. Uh, we knew from the Erie County Executive Mark Polenkars' news conference in which he announced uh, the new policies where everybody by last Sunday's game had to be uh, have at least one shot. And then by the October 31st game against Miami, I believe it is, uh, you have to be fully vaccinated. Um, but masks are no longer required because they couldn't control it. And they knew that. And the only way to then have some sort of um, insurance against heavily transmitting these diseases. Well, okay, if you're not going to wear the mask, then you have to show the proof that you've had at least a shot. Um, but yet there's signage still all over the stadium that says masks required by, I think I'm paraphrasing, government mandate. Um, so that's, well, that's not true. I think, 
I don't. When we're agree walking with... around in the press box. Uh, we don't know if we're, we need to be masked or we're, right. we were told we were told by the county executive we don't have to be. And now there's signage that says we do. And um, I don't and, agree with the policy change. And it, I've seen different things. And it seems like it's going a little bit back and forth on this. But that if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask and you have to wear a mask if you are or if you're under 12 and obviously you can't get vaccinated. But we know that with this Delta variant and various other reasons that the virus still can be transmitted between all vaccinated people. So there is still usefulness to the masks. If we're not, oh, I get that, but right, are, right. do we have to, or do we, or don't we have to? Well, I think that it's another layer of protection and it doesn't hurt now. I know that, but do well, what are, what are the rules? I well, don't, if you, if it's, I, your, if it's your, if you feel better with the mask on, I get that. But if you don't want to, do I still have to? The sign so says so the county executive clarity, says I don't, right? but the sign says I do. There should be more clarity. In my opinion, is the rule should be maybe it's a soft mandate, but the rule should be wear the masks or encourage mask wearing. And even if it's difficult to enforce and not everybody's going to do it, and the masks aren't one hundred percent effective, we know that, but they do help um, a little bit. I think helps. It's a layer of protection strategy. We have some. The vaccination is doing some work for us, and the masks are doing some other work. And I think. There was a lot of disappointment that, what did they say, only 53% usage of the masks in that first game when they didn't have the vaccine policy. But 53% is better than zero. So if, even if it's tough to enforce and not everybody's following the rules, if you get half the people to wear the mask half the time, I think that helps a little bit. And it makes it easier to get to a point where if we decide later on, yeah, everybody really should mask up, um, you still have it on you. You still have that habit of, carrying it and using it because once you tell people that they can take their masks off it's hard to put them back on you know I believe in masks as a policy but I would tell you personally that I don't always wear the mask when I'm supposed to especially at the gym or playing basketball when maybe I know logically I should wear the mask but once I got out of that habit of wearing it and I feel like I'm protected by my vaccine it's hard for me to put that back on and use it unless there's a rule in place that tells me to do it. And then when there was a rule, I wore the mask and I didn't complain about it. So I do think maybe it's a tough, it's a gray area, but I still think that there should be more clarity and more thought put into whether masks are still needed. And one quick point I want to make, just something that you said, you know, we don't know about players' wives and Rachel Bush and things like that. Maybe they there was an exemption for them. But I do know that, or I did see anecdotally that some fans were able to get in with fake vaccine cards or the checks were lax. They didn't have to show ID. And if that's the case, then how effective is this policy and is it really working? And is that something that needs to be cleaned up? I know I went to the all elite wrestling show in Rochester last night and they had a vaccine policy and they did ask for the ID. They did seem to be doing a pretty good job of making sure everybody had legitimate proof of vaccination. I think but, the answer could be just more random checks, you know, kind of a TSA approach to, you know, taking a look. And if they were to up the randomness of it, you don't have to get, you don't have to check everybody's card, but with the added threat of, if you get busted, that is a felony. Uh, you just need to publicly, you need to, you need to catch a handful of people and make an example of them. Uh, you know, you only, you know, you, you put the mugshot of the guy who throws the first couple of dildos onto the field. And then eventually people stop, you know, uh, throwing dildos on the field because they've seen the guy get walked into the courtroom in his orange jumpsuit on Monday. Um, well, and another thing is they've gone to paperless ticketing. You have to show your phone or a digital ticket to get into the stadium. But with the vaccination cards, you can show a paper card or the digital app. And maybe it would be more effective to say you have to get, this digital Excelsior app to get in or whatever app they use. And maybe that's harder to fake. Cause I think the way a lot of people got into the game, at least from some of the posts and scuttlebutt that I heard was with a copy of a card or a fake card. It was a lot easier to uh, fool the people at the door with a piece of paper than it might be with the app. These are like 1980s era uh, bouncers at the club. Uh, not necessarily the, the 2021 bouncers at the club who can spot a fake ID, you know, that was made with the, your, your home printer. But maybe there's ways that this can be done technologically. Last year you had to get a test. How were they able to ensure that everybody that walked through the stadium actually got that test and did that properly. And, and maybe it, it involves 
registering yourself as a vaccinated fan uh, the day before the game or the Friday before the game and not having it come down to uh, the people at the gates and when 60,000 people are all trying to walk in at the same time. All great points. But before we get to Joel, I want to remind everybody that Amherst Pizza and Ale House is the place to watch all the college and pro football games. It's there at 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville, right off of Millersport Highway and the 990. It's easy to get to. Amherst Pizza and Ale House has a fleet of TVs, indoor and on the patio, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. There's a lot of energy in that place. And uh, it's where Jonah Bronstein and I go when we're done covering the games on Sundays. Stop in or call for takeout and delivery, 716-625-7100. Let me give it to you again, 716-625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. And now it's time for... Joel Staniszewski on the line from Vegas. Joel Staniszewski is our resident handicapper, odds maker, analyst. He's done it all out in Las Vegas uh, for a number of years. He's the pride of Sloan, New York. Went to St. Joe's, went to Buff State before he got into his gambling career. Well, that's no, no, I shouldn't say gambling career because that makes it seem like you try to make your money gambling every week. You are in the you are in the industry. Correct. That's fair to say. You also I don't make my that, money gambling. You're implying that he wasn't making bets and taking bets while he was still at St. Joe's. <laughs> That's I right. Was not. I had I had no um, even thoughts about betting until I moved out here, and then I was all about it. They never oh. teach you the things you need to know in school. Right. Yeah. They, they talk about you know make sure you get a TI eighty one graphing calculator but they don't tell you how to you know figure out a parlay payout well let's talk about the joel staniszewski origin story how did you go from sloan new york to becoming a industry um having a career in the gambling industry in the sports Uh, betting industry yeah um i moved um to las vegas after uh, the, the summer of 2005 and uh, was saw the casinos and I thought these gigantic billion dollar businesses are awesome. How do I get involved? And I was really into sports and I figured, let me see how this works out and just got basically got lucky applying at a, a sports book. My first sports book I worked at was at Bally's. Um, just got lucky that I got hired and just literally just took off from there. What is the training like for that job? Because I think a lot of people would look at it and say, man, if I could make a career with sports betting, even you know, on the other side of the counter and get to a point where I'm helping to set the odds uh, or I'm handicapping for other people, how do you learn the industry? And how did the, I guess, how patient are they in training you? So it's, it's, it's very similar to any other job. You got to kind of figure out the, how you do the job, how you punch out the ticket, what you have to do to do it, what you have to have people tell you, you know, betting numbers. You don't just say, I want to bet the bills. You have to have a specific betting number. You got to, you know, and then the more and more you kind of get into it and the more you enjoy it, the further you can go. I mean, like that with any other career, you know, if you really like cheeseburgers, you can work at McDonald's, but if you really get in there and you start really busting your ass, I'm like, okay, you could be this store manager one day. So it's like that with any job. So um, I had a, a, a manager who's now a director who kind of took me under his wing, who came from the stardust. And so he was like that old school bet to faces. Don't just move numbers. Don't just say yes to a bet. Don't say no to a bet, like bet to faces take a good bet, move the line. What and, does that mean? Bet to faces. So you don't just like, if someone comes in and wants to bet a hundred thousand dollars and they're ju- it's some, it's Billy Walters. You don't take the bet. But if Phil Ivy comes in and wants to bet a hundred thousand dollars, sure. We'll take the bet. Um, so you kind of, you know, you got to know who, who's who in the whole world of everything. Because and, Billy Walters and, is good at it. 
and he's not just doing it because he's got an itch. He might he might actually know something. <laughs> right. right. Well, in, I don't know if he's betting in prison now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's probably betting cigarettes or whatever now. But I mean, yeah, you have to know who's who's a sharp, who's a runner, who's a scalper, who's just a square, who's just a, a casino player who's got a lot of money. Like, there's all these different things to go into it. I mean, you you can be taking bets from billionaire celebrities and they're betting $20 and you could take a bet from a dude who looks like he's homeless who takes out a shoebox full of hundred dollar bills. I mean, it's, it's, it's the craziest thing to get into. And the, the further you get into it, this, the crazier it gets. Do you have a, a story you like to tell at parties that, uh, that would sum that up? <laughs> I know I'm putting you on the I mean, spot, it's... but. There's a million stories. There's a, uh, there's an, okay. There was a guy, I was just thinking of this guy not too long ago. His name was, I believe his name was Chris Kelly. RIP. He was somehow involved with Rod Blogdanovich. Is that my saying that name correctly? Rob, Rod. Blagojevich. He was totally, totally into illegal stuff, crazy amounts of illegal stuff. And he came in and was, and bet, every single game on the board for like $30,000 a pop and then bet all the ticket writers tickets for ourselves for $220 a bet for every single game. And as you, if you know anything about cash transactions and stuff like that, like at a certain point it starts to get reported to the IRS. So this guy um, hit all these bets. So literally he hit every single bet. He hit like 16 bets a week, two weeks in a row. I mean, he might've missed like one. So I'm cashing my, my, my toke tickets, which is what it's called. Tokes is your tips. I'm cashing my toke tickets and I have to stop or else I have to report it to the IRS because this guy was so hot for like two weeks. He hit almost every single bet he made, gave everyone their own tickets as well. And just was on fire. So like, yeah, this guy was nuts. And then I, he mysteriously died in a car with a, exhaust pipe uh hose stuck in it with bullet holes or something some crazy like these crazy stories of of people that uh, it, that's just like the first one i could think of off the top of my head but like did the guy ever bottom anybody... out like he i'm sure he didn't stop no. after two weeks no he kept going i don't remember where he went to from there but that, that like two week period because you have like a little box you keep your your tokes in the little lock box and at the end of that two week period, it was just overflowing with tickets and they all hit. It was nuts. Everyone was so excited. We're all cashing out all this money. We're all like, you know, chilling. Um, but yeah, I mean, anybody who's worked in a sports book for a long period of time has a million stories about funny stuff and crazy stuff and celebrities and total just dirtbag degenerates asking you to borrow money so they can make bets. And I mean, it's, it's just a madhouse. Who's a, a celebrity that came in and you were not impressed with him or her? <laughs> so for some reason, I'm, I'm not really impressed with any celebrities, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, like I, they I, were disappointing in terms of their behavior or they, how they treated people or. Uh, the, uh, the guy who used to coach the Yankees. Joe Torrey. He came in with the fat guy that Pedro Martinez threw on the ground. Don Zimmer. Oh, probably also RIP at this point. And the dude, do you remember something that was really popular a couple years ago called Magic Jack? Where a you beer? could like plug your phone into your computer and then you oh, could get right. free yeah. long distance phone yes. calls. Yes. <laughs> Magic. So Magic Jack hung out with those dudes and he was such a prick. It was just like, I couldn't stand the guy. Oh, wear like Magic Jack t-shirt, Magic Jack jacket, Magic Jack hat. And he's just like a total prick. And I don't even know what the hell happened to that guy, but like. You know, Magic a... Jack's our new sponsor, Joel. <laughs> cut that part. Cut that part. We love Magic Jack. <laughs> uh, Joel, uh, the Bills, 17 points. Uh, I sent you a text as soon as I saw it. Uh, you said that seemed, a, a, you know, maybe a strange number, but accurate because 14 isn't enough. Uh, so your, your thoughts, and it's, it's upheld uh, throughout uh, the past few days. Yeah, it's come down a touch. It's opened at 17 and a half. 
and I will argue with anyone that that might very well be the highest point spread we'll see all year on any game. Um, there's some other really strong teams versus really bad teams, but they're later on in the season. So it's really hard to tell what a San Francisco 49ers are going to need to do in week 17 or um, there's another game that's like week 18 that maybe bills at jets. But if, if there's if the divisions and your placement are already wrapped up, it's hard to, to assume that you're going to be playing all your starters. So it's very possible 17 and a half will be the biggest opening number of the year. Yeah. We're looking at 16 and a half now with a total of 47. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts? You, uh, by the way, I should review, maybe it's time to start just taking the over with Buffalo again, which is what you did all last year. Um, last week's bets, a total of four, you doubled up on the bills minus seven. So that's two wins right there. Uh, but you had the under 45 and a half and the Steelers minus three, that one didn't pay off, but incremental growth, Joel, you had a push yeah, of a week at two and two now yeah, up we'll to uh, we'll four, 10 and one on the season. Um, we're getting your, there. Your thoughts on this game. So when you, when you have a total, when you bet totals, I mean, I guess sides as well, but I mean, sides can always come back, but when you bet totals and you have a fluke play, like a 75 yard screen play for a touchdown followed by a pooch kick, uh, fumbled kickoff that leads to another touchdown a, a minute later, it, it's really hard to, to, to think that's going to go under. And even, even this game this week, this game is dangerously close to a correlated parlay. And for anyone who doesn't know, correlated parlays is when you have like, I'm trying to think of who's the best college team right now. Alabama. Alabama versus Buff State. <laughs> Alabama minus 60, total 71. Like you can't, no sports book is going to take a parlay Alabama to the over because if they cover, it's going over. It's getting pretty close. I mean, I'm sure every book will take a bills to the over, but if you bet bills to the under you you're saying that they're going to win 35 to three 40 to 40 to five, you know? <laughs> so how often does that happen with NFL games where they won't take that parlay? Very rarely, extremely rarely. Um, like I said, college, it's a little more, or rather was a little more um, something that they really kind of focused on to stop. Um, but I mean, maybe the Patriots like 2008 when they were, you know, covering 25, 24 point spreads and 18 point spreads every single week. But for the most part, they're really not going to, to reject a bet. But from a betting standpoint, if you think another professional NFL team is going to get shut out, that's a pretty bold request. You know, the Bills have a good defense, but I wouldn't say the Bills have a, you know, 2000 Baltimore Ravens type defense where they're going to win every single game and not give up a point. So if you're going to go Bills, I feel like you got to kind of have to go over. So they're thinking, what, 37 to 10, right? would be what we're looking at. It, it, you know, Vegas is trying to figure this out. They have the bills at minus 16 and a half. So 37 to 10 would be a comfortable score to pick uh, in, right. in and, their mind, but that's and, the push. And the same thing goes. Yeah. The same thing goes with, um, no, it wouldn't be a push on the side. That'd be 27, not 17. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. But I do, I'm not doing if that. If you look so. at, if you if you look at last week, I mean, yes, after we were up twenty one nothing when it was twenty one fourteen, it got kind of close again. But after a while, it was so one sided that garbage time touchdowns are going to happen, you know. So, you know, that game was already over by the time their last touchdown hit. But I mean, the Bills are up thirty five to ten. They're 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 not going to be trying to stop them they're just going to be trying to end the game so like we were saying if you like the bills then you also like the over which is what i'm i'm taking this week 
All Bills. right. The, the Bills have been a very good defense for the first few weeks, and they finished strong last year but weren't so great on defense last year. How does that change the over-under calculations when you're betting with that team? I think you got to factor in the team that they're playing, the quarterback that they're playing, um, the offensive line that they're playing, what this other team has done. Their running game is is awful. Their offensive line play is not good. Their quarterback is okay. But when they when he has to pass last week, when they started the game, he was doing okay. But when it got to the point where they the defense knew he was going to be passing, I mean, there he was he was a dead man back there. What about other games, Joel? What do you like? So the reason why I bet the Bills last week double is because I felt like that line was off three, four, five points in my mind. So there's another game this week that I also think is just about that far off, and that is the Atlanta Falcons plus one and a half. They should be a three and a half plus point favorite, in my opinion, uh, by factoring in power rankings, simulations, just based upon feel, uh, the importance of the game, the, the, the matchups, the players, the, you know, who's, you know, maybe I got to factor some more in that end of that feel like, is Ben Roethlisberger over the hill type of feel, but I feel like that number is very skewed and very wrong. So we're going to go Atlanta plus one and a half. Are I we like in the right the... place here? I might be looking in the wrong spot here. I'm seeing Atlanta minus four, and it's off Scroll the board up. in a lot of places. Scroll up. What am I get? What am I doing here? You're looking at next week. I'm looking at last week. The heck? Okay, here we go. My bad. Uh, okay, yeah, Atlanta and Washington. You just got a load of Washington. And uh, I'm actually seeing it now. Yeah, one or one and a half. Okay, sorry about that. So you like Go ahead and give Washington a point and a half. Sorry. Yes, take the Falcons. Take the plus one and a half. Take the Falcons. Oh, you, okay. My, all right. I'll get this right. This will be edited. <laughs> it won't be edited. We're, we're just going to go with this. I'm, I'm a little thrown right now. Okay, so, uh, and you're going to do it twice. <clears throat> yep. You want to double double up on that, just like you did with the Bills last week. So you're going to take Atlanta and the point and a half. Um, what is it about that one? I mean, because a point, a point and a half is uh, is almost a pick 'em game. You're not, you know, it's not like the game's going to end in a tie, probably. Can we just um, make nope. sure that Joel doesn't have a banana in the tailpipe of his car and he's not being <laughs> out here? I got like some weird. T- I'm trying to mute myself. I got some weird. I'm choking on something. Probably someone who's after me. That's why I'm in my car. I'm living in my car right now. It's that Blagojevich <laughs> associate. That's how you were saying he went. I, I got my car bugged. Check your they mirrors. <laughs> Objects may appear closer. Any Anything else you want, Joel? Uh, New Orleans Saints minus seven. That line is could should be over seven. And some places are over seven. Could go as high as eight and a half, I think. Um, and, and I normally, if I'm going to play a game, I have to find a game that I think is about three points off of where it should be. And again, not going to win every game, but if you're getting the better of a number that you appear to be the better of the number and you continue to play like that, you you know, you'll, you'll start catching them. Um, that, that line's about eight, should be about eight and a half, in my opinion, maybe even nine. Not three points over, but it's on that key spot of seven. So as long as it's at seven, take the take the Saints minus seven. I want to point out two other games that I think are off from where they should be, but I'm leery to play them because the t- the, the, the teams. Chicago at minus two and a half. I don't know who the quarterback's going to be. No one knows who the quarterback's going to be. Um, and that that probably is contributing to why that line is lower, but it should be three and a half, four, four and a half. Um, but it's it's at 
two and a half, not playing it, just pointing it out. Okay. Um, to make a mental note. And the same goes for Denver as a pick em, um, hosting the Ravens. It's a, it's a tough one to play. I might, I might end up playing that one. It's about probably a point and a half, maybe two points off. Um, but we're not for, for our for our tracking purposes. We're not taking those two. Just pointing out to put a little asterisk next to the Bears and the Broncos. You would take Denver uh, in the pick um, against uh, a very good Ravens team because they're home. Because they're like home, the, the Broncos. I like what I see. Um, uh, Teddy Bridgewater is just a, is a winning quarterback. He he's not the flashiest. He's not you know he's not going to give you the 400 yards passing, but he just, he's a winner. And the Ravens, as far as I'm aware, are still really banged up. Um, I've said this now for a year and a half that when, when Lamar Jackson gets figured out, he's going to be a very average quarterback. And he is, he still does some great flashes and does some great plays, but I just don't think he's the, you know, top tier quarterback that a lot of people think he is. All right, so to recap, because this has not been my smoothest on the line from Vegas segment, uh, Joel is telling you to take the Bills, go ahead and give uh, 16 and a half points, and to take the over 47. He says to double up on this one, Falcons plus one and a half over Washington football team, and take the Saints, give the New York Giants seven points. And if you're feeling froggy, he has a feel. He's not putting his money on it per se, but if you're feeling froggy, you're feeling aggressive, uh, you, you, got, uh, you got the itch. Chicago minus two and a half against Detroit and Denver uh, as a pick em against the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Joel, good luck this week. Thanks again for your insights. Yeah. And uh, we'll see what that spread is for the Sunday night game against Kansas City uh, in a couple of days. It, it could be – Depending upon what happens, it could go, it could be a very, very small favorite for Kansas City. I'm talking, it could go down to like one pick. If the Bills dominate and Kansas City, well, Kansas City is playing Philly, but if, if for some reason they don't perform, Kansas City's defense right now is like Swiss cheese. So uh, they definitely have a better offense than us. That's a given, and that's going to continue. Um, but their defense, thus far this year in a small sample size is not good. Joel, thanks as always. All right. Thanks, everyone. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and is partnered up with Victory Sports, for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.